Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our virtual session on business interruption insurance and in particular where we currently are with the FCA test case. Um, I've got two members of our team joining us today. Um, we're going to delve into the detail of the test case, test, test case judgment, um, look at the implications and also consider some practical next steps. Um, we've got Stephanie, one of our senior associates, um, and Ted Powell, one of our trainee solicitors. So let's get started and delve into that detail. Please remember that you can submit any questions using the quick Q&A option on your screen as we go along. Um, and what we'll do is we'll chair a bit of a Q&A session at the end. So over to Steph. Thanks, Hannah. Hi, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so let's just start off um, by looking at uh, the background to the FCA test case. Um, so, of course, businesses across the country who are forced to close or significantly reduce their trade as a result of COVID-19 earlier this year, a lot of them turn to their business interruption policies to seek to recover their losses. However, quickly became clear that uh, insurers were going to be reluctant to pay out on those policies. So to bring, try and bring matters to a head and to try and obtain some much needed clarity as to how those policy wordings would be interpreted, the FCA brought a high court test case against a number of insurers. As it says on your slide, the FCA represented insured business, businesses and they argued that the business interruption policies in question should cover COVID-19 related losses. Whereas on the other hand, eight major insurance firms argued that the cover would not extend to those losses. Now, what's important is that the, the case only dealt with 12, 21 policies, so 21 sample policies. Um, however, it's thought that around 30, 370,000 businesses hold some sort of business interruption insurance policy. So the test case has very wide reach. The judgment itself is binding. We had judgment at the end of September. It's binding on those sample policies, but also it's, it's persuasive in respect of interpreting uh, similar policies um, underwritten by other insurers. It's worth just saying though that some types of policies weren't considered at all in the test case. An example of this is as we saw in the, the TKC London and Alliance case is that conventional business interruption insurance policies without any non-damage extensions as they're called which which Ted will come on to such as the de denial of access clauses. Um, those types of cases are unlikely to respond at all to corona coronavirus related losses. Turning back to the test case then, contrary to what many had anticipated, the High Court generally found in favour of insurers. Next slide, please. So the, the judgment itself is, is very lengthy. There's a lot to process. So the key aspects of it um, can be broken down into these three groups that you can see on your slide, um, looking from the perspective of a policy holder. So we're going to have a look at these in a bit more detail um, coming up. But as you can see, the judgment, there are there are kind of four issues which were generally positive for policyholders in the judgment. There is one area where um, generally the judgment was not po uh, positive for policyholders. And there is an area that the hybrid wording, as, as it's been called, which was somewhere in between. And we'll come on to this in more detail shortly. Next slide, please. So hot off the press, of course, we wouldn't be talking about a case like this without talking about an appeal. Um, last night we received or the FCA published the appeal applications which have been made by the parties which you can see on your screen, the FCA, the Hiscox Action Group and six of the major insurers. I mean, as you'll expect, the applications are lengthy. The grounds of appeal are very complex. The applications themselves are published on the FCA's website, so I would urge anybody that is potentially affected by this to go onto the website and have a read in full. Um, we will be digesting the appeals ourselves over the coming days and we'll circulate a summary, so do look out for that. However, in the meantime, let's have a look in some more detail at the judgment as it currently stands. Um, over to you, Ted. Thanks, Steph. If we uh, move on to the, the next slide, please. So I'll be talking about the FCA, FCA test case judgment in uh, further detail. And as I talk through it, please do drop any questions that you have into the chat. We'll um, try and address them uh, on this webinar. And if not, we'll come back to you um, in a follow up email.
So let's start by talking about the most positive aspects of the judgment for policyholders. And the first aspect that we're going to look at is disease wording. So what is disease wording? Well, broadly speaking, these are clauses that provide cover for loss caused by a notifiable disease. For some policies, the disease could have occurred anywhere. And for other policies, the disease must have occurred within a certain radius of the business's premises. It's worth noting that the disease wordings um, considered by the, the court didn't include, didn't include clauses that have an exhausted an exhaustive list of notifiable diseases, which do not include COVID-19. Um, now, these clauses are quite common in, in BI policies and the FCA test case will not be applicable to these. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. So what did the court find in relation to these disease wordings? Well, the court interpreted these policies very broadly and businesses with these policies are most likely to be covered. In relation to these wordings, the insurers argued that the clauses only covered loss caused by the occurrence of COVID-19 within the specified radius. However, the court found that the wordings covered loss caused by the entire nationwide COVID-19 disease. The court saw the COVID-19 disease as a whole and determined that the local outbreaks formed indivisible parts of it. This is really significant for businesses as it means they will not need to point to specific local outbreaks as the cause of their loss. They just need to show that there was a local outbreak to trigger cover but in terms of causation, it can be the nation, the nationwide COVID pandemic that resulted in their business losing money. It is also worth noting here that the court did uh, narrowly interpret two very specific types of disease wording. Um, these wordings include included the phrase um, loss caused in consequence of an event within the specified radius. So do look out for the phrase in consequence of an event in your policies, because there were some more um, narrow findings in, in relation to these. So that was uh, disease wordings. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll consider causation. So for policyholders, the court also made some very positive findings in relation to causation. But why is causation so significant? Well, policyholders must show that the insured peril was the cause of their loss. Now, in relation to this, the insurers argued that the insured peril under these policies was the COVID-19 disease alone, and that the insured peril did not include the resulting governmental and public responses to it. This is really significant as it would mean that policyholders would not be covered for loss caused by the government restrictions and the falls in consumer confidence that um, resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. And for many, many businesses, it was the restrictions and the falls in confidence that caused them so much damage rather than the, than the actual disease. Now, significantly in relation to, to these arguments on, on causation, the court found that the COVID-19 pandemic the actions, measures and advice of the government and the reaction of the public in response to the, the disease should all be treated as one composite cause. As a result, the loss caused by all of these factors would be covered by policies as they all formed part of the insured peril. This is a really crucial decision for businesses as it should make it significantly easier for businesses to show that the insured peril, COVID-19, caused the losses which they had suffered. Now, following this, this significant decision, uh, we had advised that businesses pursuing their, their insurers should keep full records and be prepared to demonstrate how their business activities were affected by the pandemic, by resulting government measures and by the public reaction, as all uh, three of these um, things will form part of the insured peril. So it's really important to collect evidence on how all three have affected um, the business and the revenue. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll have a look at trend, trends clauses. So 
there were all there were also some arguments submitted around the operation of trends clauses and it's important first to look at what trends clauses uh, seek to do so trends clauses operate to adjust uh, the amount paid out under policies in light of what would have been achieved if the insured peril had not occurred in relation to these clauses the insurers argued that the insured peril should be narrowly defined so they argued that the insured peril should only be the COVID-19 pandemic. And this would mean that when they're looking at the business as usual revenue figures, they would only have to ignore the adverse effects of the COVID-19 disease. Following this, the business as usual revenue figures would be reduced by the impact of the governmental and public responses to COVID-19. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for many businesses, it was the government and public responses that caused them significant losses. And therefore, if the insurers won on this point, they would be able to significantly reduce the amounts paid out under, poli under policies. However, if we move on to the next slide. The court once again found that the insured peril should be broadly defined. So it, it needs to include the COVID-19 disease, the government responses and the public responses to it. And this is really significant. It means that when the insurers are running their adjustment process, they must ignore the effects of COVID-19 as well as the effects on the resulting government of the resulting government restrictions and public responses on revenue. And this means that the insurers cannot reduce the sums paid out by looking at the adverse impact of COVID-19 and the resulting restrictions uh, in, put in place by the government and the public responses. So once again, this was a really positive finding for policyholders, as it means that insurers cannot reduce the payouts by what would have been achieved had COVID-19, the, the resulting restrictions and the resulting public responses um, if, if they never happened. So if we move on to the next slide, The court also made some really positive findings for policyholders in relation to evidence. So as I mentioned earlier, in relation to the disease wordings, many policies will require COVID-19 to have occurred within a specified distance in order for um, the cover to be triggered. Now, this raised a lot of questions um, as to how it could be proven that the COVID-19 disease occurred within the specified radius. Now, on this point, the court found that specific case evidence can be used, NHS death data can be used, ONS death data can also be used, re reported case figures could be looked at, and they also found that a, distrib a distribution based analysis or an undercounting analysis could be used. Now, the last bullet point there is quite significant as these two models mean that they can adjust figures to reflect the fact that not all people um, who had COVID-19 will have had a positive test that would fall into the death data or the reported case figures. So that, that was quite a um, broad finding from the court as it's possible to adjust figures to take into account the underreporting of actual COVID-19 cases. And in relation to specific case evidence, We'd advise businesses to take some really practical steps and think about employees or known individuals that live near to the business's premises that have got a positive COVID test, as this will be enough to trigger um, trigger cover when it's required that COVID-19 occurs within a, a specified radius. So subject to the relevant data protection rules, we would advise businesses to start recording any employees or individuals who live near the business's premises who uh, have a positive COVID test, as this is really important um, in order to, to trigger cover. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So this is the second major type of policy wording that the court looked at and the court's finding in relation to these denial or prevention of access policies were not as positive for policyholders. So what are denial or prevention of access policies? 
So these policies provide cover for loss caused by the action of some form of, of, of authority which prevents, restricts or hinders access to the policyholders' premises in response to an incident or an emergency. So if we move on to the next slide. So in relation to these policies, the court's findings can be broken down into four main areas. The general point to note is that these, these, these policies were interpreted more narrowly than the deceased policies that I talked about previously. The most significant hurdle for policyholders uh, that have these, these wordings is that the court found loss will only be covered if the action of the relevant authority was in response to an outbreak of COVID-19 within the specific radius. So this means that businesses will need to show that COVID-19 occurred within, say, 20 miles of their premises. And as a result of that specific local occurrence, the relevant authority put in place restrictions or took actions that uh, either prevented or hindered access to the premises. Now, when we're thinking about the previous lockdown we saw in March, this would be really difficult for policyholders to show. Uh, the, the government put in place a nationwide lockdown that was in response to the pandemic moving through the country in general. So it would have been very difficult for a business to show that this far reaching um, nationwide lockdown was in response to a specific outbreak within the locality of their premises. However, times are changing and the situation is very different now. And I'm sure you're all aware of the three tiered system that the government have now introduced. And the very purpose of this system is to place areas into um, lockdowns or to uh, put in place restrictions in relation, to, in relation to certain areas where they're seeing increased COVID cases. So any businesses in, in tier three may experience losses as a result of the tier three restrictions. And it could be much easier for these businesses to show that the restrictions came as a result of local outbreaks. So what we thought was a major hurdle for policyholders now may be less of an issue as the government's new three tiered system is in response to local outbreaks. So as the situation's moved on, it may be that policyholders with this denial or prevention of access wordings are able to um, meet this hurdle. The second um, area of the court's finding in relation to these policies that's interesting to consider is their interpretation of the word prevention. So some of these policies will require the um, business to have been prevented access for their premises, whereas other policies may use terms such as um, hindrance of access. Now, in relation to prevention, the court found that this means the premises must have been closed completely for the purpose of carrying on the business. In contrast to this, policies that have the word hindrance to access do not require complete closure. Now, this distinction is really relevant for businesses that were able to partially open despite the COVID-19 and the resulting restrictions. So, for example, a restaurant may have been unable to offer a sit down, eat in service and therefore lost a significant amount of revenue. However, they may have been able to access the premises to use the kitchens and offer a takeaway service. Such businesses may have issues getting cover if their policy requires access to have been prevented because the court found that it needs to be a complete closure. Whereas if, if such a business had a wording that required there to be a hindrance to access, they may have less of an issue with cover because they can show that although they were able to access the premises to use the kitchen, this access was hindered as they couldn't open the full restaurant to have a sit-in service that they would usually offer. So it's really important to consider the precise wording around the denial, prevention or hindrance of access and to consider this in relation to 
the um, business's performance and how the business was able to adapt to the restrictions as this will be very relevant when considering whether the business is able to claim under such policies. The third key aspect of the court's finding in relation to these policies involves the terminology of government or local authority actions, advice and restrictions. So there was a lot of argument around what constitute government, what constitutes government action, what constitutes government restrictions and what constitutes government advice. Now, the most important thing to note in relation to this point is that the court found that only the regulations issued by the government on the 21st and 26th of March constituted government action or government restrictions. And this means that any businesses that have a policy requiring the loss to have been caused as a result of government action or restrictions, such businesses will only be able to claim losses from these dates onwards because the court found that prior to these dates, there, there was no government action, there was no government restriction, there was only government advice. So the previous government announcements when we were encouraged to work from home and we were advised not to um, go to bars and go to restaurants, the court found that that didn't constitute action and so it wouldn't trigger cover if the policy required there to be government action that restricted um, access to the premises. Now, the fourth and final key aspect of the court's finding in relation to these policies uh, looked at the meaning of interruption. So the insurers try to argue that interruption should be taken as meaning a complete um, stop to business and the um, FCA on behalf of the policyholders, they instead argued that it just meant there needed to be some, some adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And on this point, the court found in favour of the FCA. So they found that interruption does not require the business to completely stop um, and that some kind of adverse impact is enough to show interruption. And this is really significant for businesses whose trade was adversely affected, but not, prevent, not entirely prevented by the pandemic. So again, uh, those, the example I gave earlier of the restaurant who may have been able to offer a takeaway service, but had to completely stop their sit-in service, they would be able to show that their, their business was interrupted, even though it didn't entirely stop. And if we move on to the next slide, please. So the third uh, category of wording that the court looked at was termed hybrid wording. So, so what is hybrid wording? Essentially, this is a combination of the disease wording that I spoke about first and the denial of access wording that I spoke about a moment ago. So these, these policies will provide cover for loss caused by the actions of some form of, some form of authority which prevents, restricts or hinders access to the policyholders premises in response to a disease. And if we move on to the next slide. So the court's finding in relation to these uh, policies was very mixed. There were some aspects that were really, really positive for policyholders and other aspects that weren't as positive for policyholders. So in regard to the disease aspect of these clauses, the court once again found that the COVID-19 disease needs to be taken as one nationwide cause, one insured peril, and that the businesses do not need to point to specific local outbreaks as the cause of their loss. So once again, this was, this was quite a significant win for policyholders, as it means they don't need to prove that the government actions were in response to a, to a local outbreak. It's enough to show that the government took action in response to the nationwide pandemic. However, in relation to other aspects of these wordings, the court found less in favour of, of policyholders. So once again, they found that the term prevention requires the complete closure 
and of the business and this will cause issue for any businesses that were able to partially open and offer some kind of partial service um, and they also drew that distinction once again between actions and advice of the government and found that policies that require government action will only be triggered by the regulations that came in on the 21st and 26th of March and that the previous government announcements don't constitute action so therefore wouldn't wouldn't trigger cover. So that is a walkthrough of the key findings of the judgment and once again please do put any questions that you have in relation to uh, th those findings in the chat and we will get round to answering them if we get a moment to. So I'm now going to hand back over to Steph, who's going to talk through some of the responses and implications of that judgment. Yes, thank you, Ted. A really useful, I think, uh, walkthrough of the, the, the issues which the court was faced with. Um, and that, that leads me on quite nicely to look at how this has been responded to, this judgment, um, and what's likely to happen next. And also we will turn at the end of, of this section just to look at some practical tips as well. So in terms of the immediate response then, as, as I noted at the top of this presentation, we have had some developments over the last 24 hours. Um, the first being that the High Court declarations have been agreed between the parties and published. Now, these, this is a set of declarations as to the interpretation of the sample policies in light of the High Court's judgment. So it goes through the 21 sample uh, policies and applies all of those principles which, which Ted has talked about to those policies and explains which parts of those policies um, respond to business interruption losses arising from the pandemic and which don't. So again, these declarations are specific to the 21 sample policies only. However, the point I made earlier around, um, you know, there will be some persuasive interpretation points in there for any policyholders with similar worded policies. Um, so certainly I would advise any policyholders with uh, ongoing business interruption issues to review those declarations in full. They are all on the FCA website. Um, and just moving on to the appeals, as I said earlier, we now have eight applications to appeal the judgment. Um, one is from the FCA, one is from the Hiscox Action Group and the rest are from the insurers. So some of those findings which Ted spoke about um, are now being appealed. These are so-called leapfrog appeals, which means that the parties don't need to go to the Court of Appeal before they can appeal to the Supreme Court. That's done entirely for speed here. Um, the, the parties have agreed that this, the appeals by the Supreme Court will be heard on an expedited basis, um, which is what we've seen throughout this, this test case. And, and I think um, given the importance and the ongoing losses being suffered by policyholders, that's absolutely crucial. Um, the rumblings are that we're, ho we're hopeful that we will get that Supreme Court hearing before the end of this year but watch this space. The grounds of those appeals, as I said earlier, are set out in all the applications. I, I would urge anybody affected to go and review those on the FCA's website and look out for our summary. But taking all of that into consideration, I, I do think you know, any affected policyholders do need to be act, acting quickly um, in terms of pursuing their claims against the insurers. Um, any ongoing appeals should not should not prevent policyholders from settling their claims while the appeal is determined and insurers cannot legally hold off payment as a result of the pending appeal and indeed the FCA as they would FCA have encouraged all insurers to conclude their claims processes as swiftly as possible um, and consider any claims handling steps they can take now irrespective of, that, of those ongoing appeals. And just a, just a final word on this slide around the the impact of the judgment. Um, obviously, as I said earlier, the, the judgment itself is only binding on those sample um, policies. Um, but of course, the wording can be used uh, persuasively. The, the judgment can be used persuasively for interpretation purposes in respect of any, any business interruption policies with similar wording. Finally, just one point on, on the limitations of 
the, the test case and any appeal. Um, of course, what it what it doesn't do is give um, any information about um, how much is payable under each individual policy, even if cover can be established. So we can foresee that even once the appeal process is exhausted, we're likely to con continue to see disputes over the levels of payouts under the policies um, for the foreseeable future. If we just move on to the next slide. We can just move on and, and have a look at some practical steps for um, for policyholders in light of the FCA judgment. And the, the first the first step seems obvious, but it's certainly worth reiterating that every policy is worded differently and every business is different. So uh, we would strongly suggest any policyholders with issues look at their wording, look at it in, in light of those issues which Ted has talked about from the, uh, the FCA's findings look at it in light of the, those declarations that have now been published and the grounds of appeal that have now been put in. Notification is key, um, particularly where, uh, you know, the, the, the business interruption arises as a result of the second wave rather than the first wave. I, I would imagine that, you know, any notifications in respect of the first wave of the pandemic um, will now be out of time if they've not been notified properly. But, you know, ev every, every policy will have a uh, a set process which um, will need to be considered carefully. Some policies, for example, will define the procedure for making a claim, including the steps that they expect a business to take in order to try and reduce their losses. Um, also, the policy will specify when to notify the insurer and what information to provide to the insurer when making a claim. And any failures to follow this, the procedures set out in the policies can obviously lead, lead to a court siding with the insurer in the event of any refusal to pay out. So those notification processes are really important and really key. Finally, loss is really important. It goes without saying really that businesses should be calculating how much they think their business has lost due to the interruption and they should be collecting evidence and records as they go along. Normally, business interruption policies will cover loss of gross profit, loss of rent, additional expenses and potentially the cost of preparing the claim itself. What's important obviously to note is that insurers will ultimately decide how much they're prepared to pay um, in relation to, to the losses. So policyholders should certainly expect to um, have to accept reductions in their actual losses. And also policyholders should be prepared to demonstrate how they have mitigated their losses. So the final point to note just on this is that every uh, policy will obviously contain some indemnity limits. So when looking at loss, those do need to be borne in mind as well. And if we just look at the next slide, I think it's important to put this into this whole you know, subject into a more international um, focus and look at how the approach of the UK courts compares with the approach in other jurisdictions because it's likely that whilst every jurisdiction has its own rules and is not bound by the UK High Court, we can foresee that particularly common law jurisdictions such as Australia will be persuaded by what's happening here in the UK. So just to take two examples from the countries on your slide, Australia, for example, the New South Wales Court of Appeal has heard a business interruption test case bought by the Insurance Council of Australia um, and judgment is on that as expected in the com coming weeks. But that case does have quite narrow scope um, and will consider the application only of two specific insurance claims which have been uh, rejected by the insurers um, who are the defendants in that case. And the case may well turn on the court's interpretation of two specific pandemic exclusion wordings. So extremely narrow, but the insurance companies in Australia are bracing themselves for an unfavourable judgment following what's happened in the UK test case. So we'll watch this space on that one. And then secondly, looking at Ireland, the Commercial Court is currently, as we speak, hearing a test case between a number of well-known pubs and the FBD Insurance PLC. That case began on the 6th of October and is expected to run for at least 20 days. So later, later this month, early next month, we might get judgment in that one. 
it's quite it's got quite wide scope that test case um, and it will help determine if FBD are liable for the losses suffered by some 1300 policyholders who are forced to close. So again, we'll be watching that one quite closely, but it's just quite useful to put into into context that the UK test case in many ways has been a, a bit of a trailblazer and has been one of the first that we've got um, a, you know, a judgment on. And then just looking at the next slide, please, we'll have a look at what the future might might hold for business interruption insurance. Now, of course, just to reiterate, the appeals will be ongoing. Um, the impact of those appeals will inevitably affect the future of business interruption claims and the wording of business interruption policies going forwards. But of course, we are now seeing more local lockdowns. We're seeing, unfortunately, further restrictions in the UK. Um, in particular, this the three tier system in tier three, pubs, bars, hospitality venues, etc., do need to close. We've seen that happening more widely across the UK over recent days. These restrictions may well trigger cover under some of the more narrowly interpreted uh, policies such as the denial of access policies which Ted talked about where the government action is required to be in response to a local outbreak. So businesses in these areas where um, tier three restrictions have, um, have hit should carefully monitor the introduction of those localised restrictions and collect all information and evidence in respect of their losses that they're suffering as a result. As the government also introduces further restrictions to all of us, such as rule of six, 10 p.m. curfew, that, that will also have, have an impact. And again, the advice is as before, evidence should be collected as, as you go along. Increased testing is, is worth noting. As more people are getting tested, it may become easier to, to prove that COVID-19 has occurred within a certain radius of the business premises, which is required still by many policies. So to the extent um, that you're able to and to the extent the data protection laws will allow you to, um, policyholders should keep a record of um, po positive tests within the specified radius within their policy to the extent that you're able to. And then just looking finally at the future of business interruption insurance, I think inevitably pandemics are now going to be a you know, shift the landscape for um, all insurance and pandemics will now become a key consideration for, for anybody purchasing any type of insurance really going forwards. And business interruption insurance will be no exception. However, at least in the, the business interruption context, you, you will hope once this appeal process has been exhausted, there will be a, le a binding legal precedent upon which insurers can base the, the writing of their policies going forwards. Lloyds of London, all the way back in July, before we even had the judgment on the FCA test case, published three open source frameworks which insurers and governments could use to protect businesses against future risks such as pandemics. They, the insurance industry called these black swan events. And it remains to be seen whether insurers and governments will actually use these frameworks, but certainly we will be following the developments in this respect because it will if implemented, it, it will provide protection against these, these kind of future major events and pandemics. So watch this space. So that's my part over with. I'm going to hand over to Hannah to look at the Q&A and just to reiterate, if you have questions, queries on anything that any of us have, have mentioned today, please stick them in the chat box and we'll try and answer some of them. Hannah. Thank you very much um, to you, Steph, um, and also to Ted. Um, we do have some time now for questions. Um, we have a couple of questions that have already been submitted that I will throw open to the panel um, now. But in the meantime, if there is anything else, please do use the Q&A box um, for some questions. And as I say, we have some time, so we will get round to answering them. So first question. Um, I think that I'm going to ask Ted this one um, because you talked quite a lot about it when you were talking about um, the various policy wording. But um, the question is this, 
Does the policy in COVID typically only cover for interruption if your premises um, were unable to open rather than being unable to carry out your business as normal? Um, so an example is given um, a physio clinic. They were obviously unable to offer patients face to face, um, but they could offer virtual appointments. So although they were open, they couldn't operate um, as normal um, and therefore did face um, business interruption as a result. What's the what's the view, Ted, from from your perspective? Thanks, Hannah, and um, thanks for for that question being submitted. So I think the most important things to look at here is the type of policy wording in question. So going back to the disease policy wordings that I considered, um, they typically don't have any requirement for the premises to be um, closed or for access to be restricted in any way. So under those policies, you can quite um, easily demonstrate that there, there was a, a disease that was COVID-19 and this, and this resulted in loss and you therefore should be covered. Um, I think it's more difficult in relation to prevention and denial of access policies because these uh, types of wordings do require there to be some form of restriction to the premises. And in relation to these policies, I think the really important question is that distinction between prevention and hindrance that, that I considered. So um, just uh, to recap that, if there's the word prevention in there or denial, then you, you'll be required to show that the, the business premises were completely closed. So in the instance of being able to access the physio clinic to offer a virtual appointment, you, you might struggle to show that you were completely prevented any access. However, if, if the policy includes um, wording such as hindrance, then I think it would be much, much easier to show that even though you were able to access the, the premises, your access was hindered and you weren't able to um, operate normally and, and have face-to-face uh, -face appointments in, in those in those premises. So, so that's where those um, those two words have two very different meanings in the eyes of the court and it's really important to to consider them um, and then lastly it's also just worth mentioning that finding on the meaning of um, interruption uh, which is which was really significant in cases like this as well so the court found that interruption doesn't mean a complete cessation of business and that it's enough to show that your business has been affected in some way so there's no way that the insurer could avoid liability by claiming that your business wasn't interrupted in this case because it, because it clearly has been. Um, the, the really important thing to consider is whether uh, your business premises were um, required to be prevented from being accessed or just hindered from being accessed. Great. Thanks very much. Um, it, I mean, it sounds to me like the, the first port of call on that is to look really carefully at the policy wording and just precisely work out what, what that cover was all about. Um, and actually what how you were affected as a result of the pandemic both now and obviously moving forward with these different change of circumstances. So reviewing policy wording is key from the sound of it. Thank you, Tom. Um, Steph, second question for you, um, please. Um, and this is kind of looking at an alternative um, way of maybe getting some recourse for business interruption that has arisen out of this pandemic. Um, and the question specifically, um, if my business interruption policy won't pay out, can I make an alternative claim against someone else, for example, my insurance broker? Thanks, Hannah. Yes, yeah, so this this is an issue that we are seeing arise more and more frequently where businesses have instructed a professional insurance broker to obtain the insurance in the first place and now the insurance isn't paying out. They, they want to look to their brokers to see if they can make them bear that liability. Um, it's not a simple answer um, because there are a couple of causes of action which could be brought, um, one in breach of contract, the other in negligence. Usually they're brought concurrently. Um, but just thinking through some of the potential challenges there, um, in order for a, for a negligence claim to succeed, uh, you would need to demonstrate duty, duty breach and causation. Um, and the question of duty here is going to be very fact specific because it's going to depend largely on what the nature of the claimant's business was. 
um, and the nature of the claimant's instructions to the broker. Often those instructions will be set out in a contract, very often not. But in my view, I think in practice, it's going to take something akin to an instruction for that broker to obtain full cover or specifically to obtain pandemic cover to establish a duty. Um, I do think it's worth also just saying that um, looking at foreseeability in that respect, the National Risk Register, as we uh, have found out quite recently, um, considered that pandemics have been a threat since 2008. So even before COVID-19 pandemic, pandemics were thought to be more likely um, than attacks on crowded places, attacks on transport or electronic attacks. Um, so I think that that brings that foreseeability question in, in more squarely. But just moving on to look at breach, um, a claimant will need to show that, uh, that a broker owed a duty to obtain pandemic insurance or similar. Um, in which case, if they didn't do that, it will be fairly easy to establish breach if that wasn't done. But as I said earlier, I think in practice, the duty is going to be slightly more uh, woolly than that. It's not going to be as straightforward. The, the kind of the final issue, and I think probably the biggest challenge in my view to these types of claims is going to be around causation. So to make a claim, we'll need to sh need to demonstrate that but for the breach, the claimant, the policyholder would have taken out the insurance that covered the risk of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's quite difficult after the event. It's always quite a difficult hypothetical uh, job to do for us lawyers, but particularly looking at business interruption insurance, the two issues that, uh, that I can foresee are cost. I would imagine that any policy that had pandemic cover a year ago would have been prohibitively expensive and a claimant would probably need to show that they have a history of being very risk averse and I think that would be difficult and that they would have taken out that policy which would have, would be difficult um, but secondly the issue of the availability of such a policy at that time the claimant would need to show that not only would they have paid for the insurance but there were products available on the market at the time that they would have they would have bought if they had been advised by their broker to do that so that's a very long winded way of saying yes, we expect to see a, a rise of insurance broker claims. We are already seeing um, that happen, but I think those, those some of those claims will have challenges. Thank you. Um, it, it does sound like um, they could be difficult with a number of barriers to overcome. Um, so I, I suppose definitely from my perspective, um, the focus initially should be around looking at the insurance, looking what coverage there is in place and looking um, at how you can use that insurance coverage um, to actually recover um, some losses. So um, definitely an option, I think, but just think very carefully um, about uh, the, the coverage um, and, the, and the way forward. Um, so we've got another question, um, I think, coming in. Um, just having a quick look at that. Um, um, more of an observation, actually, um, around it being wrong to blame brokers. Um, and I think the point on that is that um, in these circumstances, people are looking around to see if they can, um, if there is any way to get cover. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a question of blame. Um, I think it's it's around looking at how to mitigate mitigate risk um, and how to look at that in the future. But thank you very much for that observation coming in. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we have any more questions coming through, so I think it probably falls to me to just bring things to a close. Um, and just to do that, I thought um, I would bring it back to the insurance coverage piece um, and just summarise some key takeaways that we've heard from the team today. So first one for me, I think, is the importance of reviewing the precise policy wording of an insurance policy um, by reference to the test judgment. And Ted has summarised in those kind of three buckets um, the way in which the wording could apply and I think that that is really useful. Um, the second is to make sure that as a business you have complete records of losses um, and the final one that I think is really interesting is making sure that we're beginning to gather some evidence of an inc incidence of COVID-19 in your in your locality 
but not necessarily having the need to point to a specific local outbreak, which obviously is a is um, a help in relation to the burden of trying to recover and gather evidence on that piece. Um, we hope you found this useful. Um, if you've got any further questions, please do get in touch. Um, also, there's a link to the feedback questionnaire in the Q&A box. Um, and if you could find time for feedback, that would be really, really appreciated. Thanks again very much for your time um, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.